Good morning, church. It's a joy to be with you today as we celebrate this day of worship, and we are so glad that everyone is here. For those who are worshiping with us online, we're so grateful that you're with us in this time of worship, and we encourage you to uh, click the word See More in the Facebook description, and there you can see a link to register your attendance or to... uh, to uh, make your gift to the church. You also see a link to the e-news, which is where everything uh, that we talk about is there. And to those who are in the space, we welcome you as well. So for everybody who is visiting with us online or in the space, we are Wellspring. We are the place where all are welcome, all are accepted, all are loved, and all means all. And we're so glad to have you with us. Uh, We do have, I want to encourage folks in the room to register your attendance on the blue registration cards. Or if you use Shelby Next, register there. Uh, We also um, want to encourage everyone always about the e-news. Be sure you're getting the e-news. And there's a link to it on the most recent e-news on our website. They can give you more information. And uh, we also have various announcements that you, that, and so in this week's e-news, you'll see information about the final Wednesday at the well coming up this week. Uh, choir starting back on Wednesday evening with, with Wednesday evening rehearsals. Uh, the back to school bash next Sunday. Uh, there's a, a P flag pancake fundraiser that's going to be happening. And so that's, uh, that's shared in the E news. And also information uh, on adult Sunday school classes and more. There's a lot in there. So Before we begin worship in here today, we have something that we need uh, volunteers in the space to help with. So um, we need eight volunteers who will be willing to help with communion. So what's going to happen is is that you'll be given a bag that has instructions on it. Read the instructions and then you'll, you'll know. So it's bringing bread forward. And it is reading a very short passage, part of our great Thanksgiving that we do in this service. So I need to know, I need eight people, eight people. We have there, so Ann, we got Sean over here. We have two over here, yep. And so, and over here, a couple over here. Okay, how many, how many do we have left, ushers? How many do we have left? You're empty. What do we got? One, two? One bag. One, two, two. Okay, I know there are two more people who will read and who will share. Frank will. He just got voluntold. Hey, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, one more? Okay, so we're good. Awesome. All right, read your instructions. That'll come up as we, it'll be following the sermon. And, um, and, and so the instructions should tell you everything that you need to know. So it's going to be a, it's going to be an important part of our service. And we really are glad to thank you for, for, for being willing to share in that. So friends, we are here to worship we're here to experience where God is calling us into some, uh, into sometimes into some hard places. And yet it's God who is with us and God who provides for us. So as a people of God, let's stand and join together in worship. Join me in the call to worship. These words written by Dr. Lisa Hancock will be on the screens. Beloved disciples, welcome. Some of us come weary and hungry, while others come rested and content. Still others come ready to wrestle with the questions that keep us up at night. No matter how you enter this space, we say, come let us worship God together. Together we notice the fatigue we carry, the exhaustion that comes from our hunger for care and for connection with one another and with God. Yet when God says to feed one another, we answer, we have nothing but. Together we feel the unrest and turmoil of grappling with the unknown, 
unsure whether we're fighting for everyone's well-being or merely our own stability. Yet when God tells us to start by loving God and our neighbors, we answer, we have nothing but. Together then, let us wrestle with our hungers that we may be transformed into people who seek and find God all around us, so that when God calls us to feed the hungry and struggle for those in need of help, we answer, in you we have everything. Use us as you will. Amen. So we read our gospel lesson early. So listen for this word that comes to us from the gospel of Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there to a, in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, they saw, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, Let them go away. You get, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave, it to, gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
As we prepare to come to this table later in worship, we remember that Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we observe the ancient tradition of the passing of the peace, we share with one another the peace of Christ as forgiven and reconciled people, saying, Christ be with you, and responding, and also with you. And if you're not comfortable shaking hands, you can simply hold your hands in front of you as you greet your neighbor. Christ be with you. Unless you're singing with the Hokesbury Choir, and if so, come up here, otherwise you may be seated. So today's hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a great old hymn. Uh, Joseph Scriven was born in Ireland, but he moved to Canada and India. He made all of the British colonies, I think. And he, he just had a life of tragedy. His fiance died the evening before their wedding. He lost other people that he was close to. And he was just really despondent most of the time. But he managed to pin this poem what a friend we have in Jesus, about 1869. So sing along with us.
Jacob, the Jacob of the Old Testament, the Jacob who was the son of Isaac, Jacob who had stolen the birthright from his brother and the blessing that belonged to his brother from his, from his father. So his brother Esau lost out. Jacob who had been deceived by his father-in-law when he fled and who now had two wives, uh, not only the one he wished for, but her sister as well. Jacob, who then de deceived his father-in-law and who fled back home, heading back toward his homeland with all of his possessions, some of those taken from his father-in-law. Jacob was now returning home to face the music of his, of his original deception. The, the one who was the supplanter, which is what Jacob, the name Jacob literally means, is now terrified of having to face up to what is happening. So as they're getting back toward, uh, toward his, his homeland, uh, he is prepared to give it all away. He sent his, he sent messengers to appease Esau and to announce that Jacob would be returning. And uh, the messengers return and tell uh, Jacob that Esau is, is coming to meet him and he's bringing 400 men. And that doesn't sound promising, does it? A lot of anxiety there. Uh, Jacob's in a panic. He sends everything he has. He sends all of his livestock. He sends them in waves. In droves, So you have one group that goes and another group that goes and another and another in hopes that by giving all of these gifts, gifts drove by drove that he would appease the anger of his estranged brother. It might soften Esau toward Jacob just a bit. He even sent his wives and his 11 children across as well as envoys or perhaps even as gifts. We don't know. So there, there Jacob now sits on the banks of the, of the ford of the river Jabbok. And so he's, he's uh, sitting there, um, everyone, everything that he has gone, he's sitting there empty. And um, he's afraid. He's vulnerable. And if this plan doesn't work, then there is no other way to manipulate things to go in the right direction. This is all he had. And it's in that place where Jacob had nothing and where Jacob is left alone that the emptiness of his own deceit is overwhelming him. And we are told that a man comes and wrestles with him all night long. And this, my, this mysterious messenger, some call an angel, some call God, God's self, some might even call it something within Jacob that's wrestling. His own conscience or his own, his own soul so troubled. This messenger wrestles with him all through the night. And when the messenger attempts to break free before the breaking of day, Jacob refuses to let him go until he gives him a blessing. And the messenger then asks him, what is your name? And he says, Jacob, the messenger says, nope, that's not your name any longer. You're no longer going to be called Jacob. You now will be called Israel for you have striven with God and with humans and have somehow prevailed, which is what Israel means. So we're told that Jacob walked away with a limp. And from that encounter, he walked straight into the arms of a brother who hugged him. And wept. It was in that place of nothingness, that vul in that and that and vulnerability, that Israel, the person and the people, were born. Let us pray. God birthed within us something new. That we might experience, not just our own humanity, but that we might see a way that is into the authentic humanity that you've created us to be. So be with us now in our time of worship and may the words that we share here together and the meditations of our collective heart be acceptable in your sight for you, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So we move to talk about Matthew's gospel. 
this emptiness becomes a major theme as we talk about this. Many people move very quickly to talk about uh, the people who had followed Jesus and they, they tried to get away. He was trying to go on a little retreat and they tried, he tried to get away in a boat and the people saw that he was going somewhere and they just followed him around the shore and they were there whenever the boat landed on the other side. And um, Jesus had just wanted time apart. And we're told that he had compassion on them and he healed their sick and he spent time with them. When it was evening, the disciples became worried that, uh, that they, had, they were far from their own homes. They had traveled too far to travel back in the night and they would need to go into some nearby villages to buy food. Then Jesus told them, no, you will need to provide food for them. So I get that anxiety in that moment. I don't know about you, but as somebody who has worked on a staff and you know, I'm with somebody and says, no, it's your responsibility. No, it's not, I don't know what I'm gonna do here. And I have this recurring nightmare that it's time for church and I didn't remember that I was supposed to preach, <laughs> you know? It's that same nightmare that goes along with it where I show up at a party with nothing in hand only to be told that I was supposed to bring the main, main course. You know, it's like that level of anxiety is where I think the disciples are. And uh, they, they search and they tell Jesus, look, all we have is five loaves and two fish. And that's all we got. Their anxiety goes up a bit further, I imagine, when Jesus looks at them and says, that's fine, that's enough. No, no, it's not. I have served a church meal where we ran out of food. That is not okay. So we've approached this text by sharing that it's this miracle that happens. I've talked about it before as maybe being a miracle of sharing that people really don't always have nothing, that they have something. It may be not much, but that when it all comes together, it becomes something rich. Um, that... They were afraid of not having enough to share. So fear of scarcity is not a new thing, friends. We've had, we have that now. That's been around a long time. But when they witnessed the sharing and the unfolding, that maybe they just poured themselves out and took their food out and it was shared as well. And when they collected the baskets after the meal had been served, there were now 12 baskets full of leftovers. This is important. I think that's an important thing. But I think we've historically missed another layer of this text. I think there's something else going on. So when we were doing worship planning, this, this uh, well, it's a couple of weeks ago when Frank asked um, Frank Jacks, who is on uh, our part of the worship team, he said, what did Jesus hear? Uh, if we begin with the phrase, now when, when Jesus heard this, Y'all remember that when, when we started this, when Jesus heard this, he went to go to another place. He went and got in a boat. So what is that that Jesus heard? Well, if we look back just briefly, we will see that it is the beheading of John the Baptist that is right prior to this. It is John's execution. And uh, so it, it's John, when we talk about John in Luke's gospel, this is a relative of Jesus who shares ministry and that, a ministry that begins in the womb. And in other gospels, John is a leader of a movement that will underwrite the ministry and undergird the, ministry, the movement that Jesus now leads. John is the one who baptized Jesus, and John is the one who said that he himself was the forerunner and not the Christ. He was not worthy to untie the sandals of this one who was following. You remember those parts of the story? And J John is the one whom Jesus references multiple times in his teaching ministry, and now John has been executed. And Matthew's description of the execution of John is horrific. When you really read it, if you put that into a movie, it is a terrible scene. John had spoken out against Herod Antipas, calling him out for having unlawfully t take, taken the wife of his brother Philip. Herod, we're told, had arrested John, but he did not want to execute him because of the political instability that it might cause. And then... Herod is at, has a party that is a uh, is a is a, a big party that his his wife uh, who is Herodias the 
the daughter, the, the, the wife of Philip also, and, who, and their daughter uh, who is uh, dancing in their company. So um, Herod promised the daughter whatever she desired. She went to her mother. Her mother loathed John the Baptist for having called them out that way in such a public forum. And she told the daughter, ask, ask dad for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And John is executed, beheaded. His head is brought on a plate to be shared in the company of this party. So as we considered that, it suddenly occurred to me that I needed to read this text from a perspective of grief. I think that this adds the layer that is most important right here. As someone who knows a great deal about grief from the inside and the outside, it didn't take me long to have a very different feeling about this text. As we were talking about this in worship planning, I began to feel, I began to feel that place of grief and that emptiness, and then to put that into that text, and it was a, re, it was a redefining moment for me as I, re, as I heard this story. Jesus is feeling the, the loss in the pit of his stomach. And if you've ever experienced the loss of someone close to you in a tragic way, it is not just a, it's just not a feeling in the gut. It is a gut punch. It is horrific. And topics like this can come up in our grief group, as we have talked about, and in other grief groups I've been part of, as we, we talk about this, this place of emptiness that is in the gut that is an emptiness unlike any other. And the people hear about Jesus getting in a boat and Jesus has this feeling in his gut and he just needs to go be alone. And they get in front of him and they're right there. Now some of us might say, no, I can't. I need this time for me. And yet Jesus, we are told, has compassion. And they're sick and they're suffering. Jesus is in their, their only hope. And they just line up in front of him. I had a similar experience whenever we were in Haiti in the mid-1980s. And, and the, uh, we had a medical clinic that was being built. And they were running a medical clinic in a little makeshift hut beside it. And people lined up for miles. And they would stand in the scorching heat lined up to come into this to, to just for a chance to be well to experience healing and it's that kind of feeling when we look and that, that, that we see people clamoring for care and we're told that Jesus had compassion we have talked a lot about compassion here and it's the capacity to connect our suffering our own grief with the suffering and the grief of others. Jesus was in grief, with the fa in grief over the fact that his friend had been killed by the empirical powers of the state. And he saw the people who suffered oppression and abuse by that very same state. Jesus used his own grief to connect with the grief of others. He used his own suffering to connect with the suffering of others. And picking up on where Jessica and I left off last week, if you heard us uh, as we team, team, were team preaching on Romans, the end of Romans, uh, this is where Jesus takes this weakness who might be experiencing the weakness of grief and he converts it to vulnerability. He turns it into something that is, is where the healthy place to be. He becomes vulnerable. Jesus is feeling the loss and he's grieving the massive amount of suffering that's all around him, yet he's not moving away from the vulnerability. He's moving toward it, if you notice. And he's doing the one thing that he knows how to do. He's offering healing and wholeness in the face of suffering. And while Jesus is vulnerable, I think it's safe to say that the disciples were operating from a place of weakness. I think they really were. They were just anxious as they could be. They were afraid. 
They knew that the people in their mind just needed to be dismissed. They need to go. They need to get help. They need to find food. And then Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat. And their weakness is demonstrated in their notions of scarcity. We only have this. We have nothing here but. We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. You see, giving into weakness leads to our fear and our anxiety, our fear of scarcity and the anxiety that that produces. Operating from the place of vulnerability, however, means that we can hold space for that and hold space for what will happen when we see that what we have is enough. If we can just look at that place in the recent past, you have uh, heard us talk about the Enneagram, and I've told you about myself before you've heard me say that I'm an Enneagram 7, and Enneagram is a really incredible way to be thinking about spirituality. We do have a, a study coming in the, in the fall, and uh, we are, um, for the, uh, an, any, I can speak from the, my experience of this text from an Enneagram 7. Everybody who knows their Enneagram, if you know it and you've really studied it, you can speak to it from your own perspective. But here's how a seven reads this text. First, the notion of emptiness is incredibly hard for me. As a seven, I do not want emptiness or pain. When faced with grief, my typical modus operandi is to get busy. As a pastor, I know what to do around the time of death. I know what needs to be done in planning the funeral or the memorial service, helping people navigate the various issues that come up at the time of death. And I am with people. And the same happened when I lost my father and then my mother. And when I lost my father, I uh, got very busy doing things for his funeral. And I, then after that was over, I got busy back at the church because I was moving. It was actually the year I was moving here. So I was getting ra things wrapped up at the church where I was serving right before I came here. And then I had a phone call from my coach. I have a, my, my own life coach. And his name is Don Eisenhower, and Don is the uh, owner of Coaching at End of Life, which is one of my certifications. And Don called me, and he, he asked me how I was doing, and I rambled on for a little bit. And then he, he said, I'm going to stop you. I want to ask you a question. Jeff, are you mourning? And I went, well, I'm, you know, I just told you, I'm like, I've got all these things going on and I'm feeling, yeah, I feel the, the grief and everything. He said, no, not are you just feeling grief while you're busy doing other things. Are you mourning? And what did that mean? It meant that I was challenged to sit still and hold sacred space for the emptiness and the grief that I was experiencing. It was to ritualize my mourning, to do that which would, would remind me that grief is something that needs to be poured out, that is something that is, is, that is it, I walk through and I walk in and I have to be mindful of it. And it was a call for me to lean into the vulnerability and not just to fill all this space with planning and doing. And what I was called to do was be deeply in touch with the emptiness that I was experiencing. The only thing that I had to do in that moment was to be mindful and to hold sacred space for that grief. And when I do that, friends, I've gone to the healthier place of a seven. It's to practice mindfulness amidst pain, emptiness, grief, and suffering. And it's only from that vulnerable place that I can more intimately connect with God and with the suffering of others. Jesus in this story is empty. He's feeling the prof profound sense of loss and he's seeking a time apart to experience that emptiness, to hold that space. But as he looks at the people who have left their villages in search of healing, he likewise experiences their emptiness. And the way, that, the way that, that suffering and oppression can hollow out the lives of those in the margins. The emptiness now shows up in another way. Not only are these people suffering, they are food insecure. So put that language around it as well. 
The disciples know that they will need to try and find food wherever they can. Emptiness, you see, is the ultimate symbol for poverty, which itself is the mark of true vulnerability. But Jesus knows something about God. He sees God as the God of provision. This is the God who provides Israelites with manna from heaven when they are starving and water from a rock when they are thirsty. This is the God who clothes the lilies of the fields that are greater than, than Solomon in all his glory. Jesus reminds his followers over and over and over again not to worry or be anxious. If you read the text, do not worry, do not be afraid about what tomorrow brings. Even when we pray the Lord, Lord's Prayer, what do we say? We ask only for daily bread. We just need today's provision. We're not to worry about tomorrow's bread. So let's see where God will provide bread for today. In the place of sorrow, suffering, oppression, poverty, and grief, God shows up. And that's important to know. No matter how the bread and fish go from the meager offering to 12 baskets of leftovers, it doesn't matter. The important part of this story is that God shows up and God is all about abundance. So church, as we look at all the opportunities for ministry around us, as we consider the people who continue to be oppressed and marginalized by both the government and the church where we live, as we see the needs of those who are suffering, as we see the needs of those who are grieving, those who are in poverty, those who seek only to be seen, we may well convince ourselves that we just don't have enough to go around. But if you will embrace your own sense of emptiness and vulnerability, friends, it's there that you will discover the source of true compassion. It's there that you will meet the God of abundance. So bring your emptiness into the presence of Christ. This basket behind me is empty, but will soon be full. And friends, when you bring your emptiness to Christ, Christ will use that to change the world. Amen. Those of you who raised your hands to volunteer, now is the time. So y'all can gather over here. Andy will kind of help y'all understand what you need to do as we begin our communion liturgy together and as we prepare to receive this meal. Let us join together in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, all vulnerable God, creator of heaven and earth. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. And this ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you in your right hand.
you delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. Okay. His, at his ascension you called him to sit and reign with you at the right hand. So on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, that cup that, he, that symbolized that which he had poured out for himself. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at Christ's heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, all vulnerable God, now and forever. Amen. 
And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Those who are assisting with the serving of communion will please come forward. So the table is set. It's a table that comes from us bringing forth gifts, and it comes from Christ pouring Christ's self out into these gifts to the world through you. And so as we talk about this place of grief and vulnerability, this is a place where we come empty. We come in need of this holy meal. And it's here that then we find that we ourselves are fed. And in the feeding, we become the body of Christ. So you'll be invited to come as our ushers will bring you forward. We have two stations here by which we do the method of intinction. For those at home, you're invited to go ahead and take that bread and take that cup and you, you drink, eat and drink and celebrate this meal with us for um, the, the method of intinction here is you, take, you, you get, are given bread, you take that bread and dip that into the cup and you eat the juice-soaked bread. If you have gluten sensitivities, we have, uh, Marie here has uh, gluten-free elements. You come and take from the plate, dip that in the cup and you eat. For those who are uh, still very conscious about uh, germs and so forth, the, um, the, the small self-contained packets are here as well and you peel the top layer for the wafer and the next layer for the juice. So you're invited to come as uh, our ushers bring you forward.
Let us thank God together for this holy meal that we have received. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we pray, oh, I'm sorry, you may remain seated. <laughs> what I meant to say was, ushers, please come forward. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong hand gesture. We come with all of our imperfections. We come with all of our emptiness. And we're invited to bring our gifts, no matter how great or small, with the faith that God can multiply them. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the place of emptiness because it's in that place that we can discover vulnerability and connection with you, connection with deeper parts of ourselves, and connection with others who may be hurting or going through a hard time or grieving or experiencing oppression or being cast out. Bless these gifts and use them to help us to be the church that reaches out beyond our walls, that reaches for the outcast. And we can't do it on our own. We can only do it by your blessing. So bless those who give <clears throat> and bless those who receive in this place. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So how about at church, when God calls you beyond that place of weakness to that place of vulnerability, when you look past your scarcity and you find that there's something inside of even your emptiness that the world needs, what will you offer? How will that change the way you live your life? Let's ponder that together. Let's consider that. Let's experience that invitation from Christ as we sing the first and fourth verse of Give to the Wind Thy Fears.
Let us in life in death thy steadfast truth declare, and publish with our latest breath thy love and guardian care. So friends, we go forth as people who understand emptiness and vulnerability, but we go forth as people who see how God and God's abundance work right through us into a world that is desperate for a word of hope. So go be the church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace.